So as you may know, I've made a few videos on Lords of the Fallen, starting with three playthroughs wherein you can see a somewhat optimistic version of myself slowly succumb to the frustrations held within the land of Mornstead. By the third video, I was at peak bitterness, at which point I decided to end the playthrough rather abruptly. In the following video, I attempted to collect my thoughts and vent my frustration with the design and mechanics of the game. Surprisingly, it turned out way better than I anticipated, with so many people chiming in on the conversation about some of the game's more undesirable aspects, while others lambasted me over the fact that I'd critiqued the game without experiencing all it has to offer. While it is possible to produce an adequate review based on a few hours of gameplay, I believe a review based on the complete experience holds more credibility. But while I'm not here to review the game per se, I plan to share my point of view as a fan that wished better for this game, and share my thoughts on crucial moments that shaped my experience. So after about 30 minutes of wandering aimlessly around the map, I eventually found the doorway to the next region I was meant to brave. As you can imagine, it's been a while since I last played Lords of the Fallen, and it didn't help that my sense of geographical orientation is comparable to that of a lost toddler in a pick and pay hypermarket, or Walmart for you Yankees out there. I'm not even joking when I say, it was no longer than 5 minutes before I was reminded why I dropped off this game in the first place. Starting off on the new pathway, I ran upon an enemy that's clearly meant to draw your attention, only to be immediately ambushed by some other jackass. After that, I was greeted by a wall that served no purpose other than sending you into the umbral realm. After that, I was beaten to a near inch of my life. But hey, there's a seedling bed here, mere seconds away from an actual vestige point. Well, to be fair, there is a mini boss between them, and my my, Hexworks could not contain themselves here. They couldn't help but put a little dog minion to spice up the fight. And if that wasn't enough, they added an umbral orb to shield these guys and placed it on the opposite end of the arena. But hey, guess what? It doesn't end there. If you die at any time during this fight, there's a rather nasty secret waiting for you in the umbral. Yes, that's right. If you, for any reason, find this boss difficult, you better beat this boss in your first life, because if you don't, this handsome fellow is eagerly awaiting to teach you the meaning of pain. I mean, I spoke about all these small issues and how they detract from the game's enjoyability. If you haven't seen that video, I highly recommend checking it out as it goes in depth with some of the mechanics and features I don't agree with. Now I'm going to try something and I want you guys to stick with me for a bit. If a game developer is a chef, and the dishes they create are the games, then the ingredients itself would be the design. For example, combat and story making up the meat and potatoes. Now, anyone can throw ingredients into a pot and make a stew, but a good chef knows how to season the dish and more importantly, they know how to show restraint. You see, the herbs and spices is the chef's own flair. It's the thing that makes it special and sets it apart from other dishes. Too little and your dish is bland. Too much and the flavor becomes too intense so much that you can't stomach more than two bites. From Software, the creators of the Souls games have mastered this recipe. A dash of difficulty, a pinch of ambush and just a light dusting of Parmesan cheese strikes a beautiful balance of flavour that keeps you coming back for more. But it seems our master chefs over at Hexworks have oversaturated their dish with seasonings in an effort to make it more flavourful, substituting that dash of difficulty for a dollop that cheese dusting for a whole wheel, and that pinch of ambush for a generous fistful. Throw in a vial of salty tears shed by the player unwillingly. Now you have a recipe where all the ingredients are correct, but the proportions are all wrong. I'm betting most of you didn't expect a food analogy when you clicked on this Lords of the Fallen video, but hey, here we are. Who would have thought? Not me. Now as we make our way through the frozen food aisle of Mornstead, You'll notice a pair of blue spheres trotting along. And no, those are not invisible Frosty the Snowman's bioluminescent unmentionables. They are in fact misery and anguish manifested as assholes with arms wielding bows. Additionally, they only seem to come in combo packages of the buy one get one free variety. You see, if there's a melee character in view, you can bet your ass there's a bowman tucked away nearby. This kind of enemy placement further establishes the one trick pony that is Hexworks idea of a challenge. Now it's at this point 
where I had to mentally reacquaint myself with the cheap shot nature of combat encounters. Starting with the first boss of the area, and even though his canine companion didn't complicate the fight too much, the devs couldn't resist making it a 2v1 fight, even a 3v1 if you were unlucky enough to find yourself in the umbral. As we move to the second boss, we can see the same thing of ganking the player as a projectile based enemy, this instance being the boss, spams icicles that dart towards you while you're distracted. Needless to say, this boss was briefly the source of much frustration. To top it all off, the third and final boss of this region was arguably the most disappointing part of the game. Before we go any further, just watch the intro for this boss fight. Now based on what you've just seen here, how dope does this monster look? At this point I was bouncing in my seat with anticipation. Unfortunately this awesome looking crow monster was relegated to a cool looking background while the actual fight played out in a wave based format. The actual fight sees you soul flaying his dead daughter's ghost, all the while lesser minions and champions get in your way. After you do a bit of damage to the ghost, Big Papa Crow will reset the boss arena with some icy AoE or area of effect attacks. After which the ghost respawns and so do the minions. Rinse and repeat about 10 times and eventually the crow's head falls into the play area at which point you stab him in the eye and the fight is over. Now I'm no game developer but when you have a boss design as cool as that wouldn't you want to show it off with some over the top attack animations? Now I know most of you if not all of you would agree that fighting a crow beast is way more fun than fighting his dead daughter's ghost. The skeptic in me believes that maybe it would have taken too much effort for them to animate something like this, and the other part of me thinks maybe it would have been a clunky mess. Speaking of a clunky mess, the design of this boss battle in particular could not have been more detrimental to this game's reputation of terrible camera controls. I'm not exaggerating when I say this, and feel free to correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. The camera has somehow gotten worse since launch. Now I don't know if they altered the camera since launch, but it genuinely felt like a downgrade since I played it in November of 23. The experience of juggling enemies in this fight was so off-putting that after only 20 minutes of attempting this boss solo, I put my pride aside and used a summon to help me. If you know me, you know that I play this game solo and without using summons. As you may recall, it took me over 12 hours to beat Romeo in Lies of P, but I never once felt bored or even annoyed to be retrying it over and over again. As it stands, there is no other boss fight that I derive such an indifference to. Even though the setup of the Hollow Crow feels emotionally charged, tragic even, the design of the fight feels like an uninspired waste of potential. So anyway, we cleanse the beacon he was guarding and a little ways down the road we have a run in with the Light Reaper. And can I just say, I love how this guy hunts you down at different intervals during the game. And each time you fight him you become more and more familiar with his moves. But unfortunately I'm an extremely slow learner, so naturally he kicks my ass in just mere moments into the start of each match. Still a very cool idea, kinda reminds me of a specific elite captain in Middle Earth Shadow of War. I kicked my ass on multiple occasions until I eventually beat him. As we make our way through to the next beacon, Icy Pathways gives way to tighter spaces rife with ambush and rug pulls. Funny enough, starting with the very first combat encounter we treated to such a cheap trick. So cue the archer and at least one melee based enemy for that challenging yet satisfying gameplay loop that Hexworks understands so well. And yes I am being sarcastic, but this time they throw us a curveball by putting the umbral eye in the next area, encouraging you to run past them, potentially attracting more enemies in that area, just so you can destroy the eye that keeps them invincible. This specific encounter goes against the game's design philosophy 
of persevering through cautious and methodical level progression. Instead, it forces you to progress into the unknown with reckless abandon. Look, I, I know sometimes I can be a bit harsh on this game, but this particular piece of design stood out to me as amateur. The setup of this fight and the placement of this blue eye thing on the other side of the barricade was not a decision made out of ingenuity or fun. Instead, it comes across as an insincere attempt to create a difficult situation that feels purely artificial. Next up was another bullshit room that attempted to pull the rug from under my feet a total of four times. Starting with a mace-wielding grunt that suspiciously refused to venture past a few steps. Obviously just a decoy to draw you into the sightlines of the archers. The second instance was more literal in nature. The third instance felt like an outright lie if I'm honest. Looking at these torches maniacs from atop gave no indication that they were protected by an umbral eye. But sure enough when I attempted a plunging attack on one of them, one materialized to take this fight from obnoxious to straight up disrespectful. There's no chance in hell I was gonna take this fight. And so for the sake of my own sanity, I left and pretended like they didn't exist and moved on. And lastly, there was always gonna be an enemy concealed to the right. It's no secret at this point. Regardless, I rushed the first guy thinking if I can down him quickly it'll be a one on one after that. To my surprise, only one enemy emerged from the blind spot. Props to the devs for showing a little restraint here. They could have easily put two of them, or even three if they wanted. Plus a floating eyeball for added fun. You see how easy it is to create difficult scenarios based on Hexworks design logic? A couple of deaths and a few cheap tricks later, we find ourselves at a boss fight that employs the same logic that I just satirized. Complete with the eyeball kicker. You can't make this stuff up folks. Thankfully, the boss was not a major headache. And after defeating him, it's not long before we come across our token duo boss fight. Similarly, they weren't too crazy, but enough of a roadblock to warrant a switch up of strategy. You see, my character is a Radiant Space Bolt. I noticed the boss is spamming Radiant based attacks, so I can only assume they had great Radiance resistance. I arrived at the conclusion that my Radiant Hammer's damage was mostly being negated. So what did I do? I replaced my shield with a Radiant Sword. The reality was that I only had two upgraded weapons, both of which were Radiant based at this point and I didn't have the materials or currency to upgrade any of my other weapons. But through the miracle of dual wielding and sheer brute force, I managed to scrape past this boss fight. And even though I bitch about multiple enemies in a boss fight, this one is surprisingly one of the more enjoyable ones. Next up was the Tower of Penance. But first we had to deal with the stinky greeter. This was mostly a straightforward fight. I say mostly because the boss itself may have been easy, but at about 60% health, he started spewing a poison mist that eventually engulfed the whole play area. Unable to avoid the mist, my only choice was to go on the offense. I managed to whittle his health down to a sliver, and of course he gets one last jab in. Which actually downs me. Unlucky for him though, I'm the protagonist of this story, so I get a second chance and suffer no consequence for my greed and impatience. I deliver the final blow, and what's this? The music is still playing, the gas is still killing me, the barriers are still up, a sinner has not been judged. To my surprise, he gets up for one final bout, which gets me questioning. Am I really the chosen one? Was I meant to die on this bridge? Maybe the blessed carrier knight Sanisha is the one true protect- No, wait, I'm the one true savior. I think? We make our way to the upper levels of the Tower of Penance. I peer over the edge and catch a glimpse of what awaits us on our descent. Immediately, I see the potential for many secret nooks and crannies to uncover. Also, the inevitability of cheap tricks and ambushes that await us. So imagine my confusion when I eventually made it all the way down on my first attempt. After placing down that seedling at the bottom of the tower, I breathe the biggest sigh of relief I have ever released while playing a game. I get the feeling that many camel's backs have been broken in the specific dungeon. Please let me know in the comments how this area played out for you. Was it a treacherous slog of despair? Well, not as bad as I think it is. I would have definitely lost the plot if I died at any point because I didn't place any seedlings on the way down. Overall, I was just glad to have the platforming shenanigans in my rearview mirror. Anyways, back to the matter at hand. We descend to the depths of the tower and come face to face with Tancred, master of castigations. Castigation. 
I'ma keep it real with you guys. At the time I hadn't the slightest clue as to what this word meant. Upon further investigation, I've come to learn that it means severe criticism or harsh scolding, essentially making our friend Tancredia the Dr. Phil of Mornstead, albeit a slightly angrier version. Jokes aside though, this boss was pretty fun. A bit on the straightforward side, but enjoyable nonetheless. His second phase though, looks like it was pulled straight out of the depths of my consciousness, from repressed memories that I've aptly labelled, nope. The only thing that could have added to this boss's creep factor is if he started crawling up the walls. Also I gotta mention that animation at the start of the second phase was equal parts nauseating as it was awesome to behold. Next up is Abbey of the Hallowed Sisters, an area that I personally consider to be the worst segment of the game. Starting with the sinner Abbas Ursula, once again not the hardest boss to defeat, but when she becomes a common enemy scattered throughout the rest of the game, it creates some really annoying situations. But more about that in a bit. For now, I want to draw your attention to this sequence. Now at this point, you'd probably expect me to complain about how I just turned a corner to find myself staring down the throat of a riled up pooch, two shamblers, a mistress of hounds, and a dummy mommy. The latter of which are mini bosses made common enemies. But I'm not going to do that, because an even larger threat looms over our hero. That being the dreadfully inadequate lock-on system. If it isn't clear, when I press the lock-on button here, my intention was to lock on to the closer of the two enemies. But instead the camera targets the one further back and even though you can't see it, I am flicking, pushing, rolling and dragging the right stick to get it to switch to the closer one. Nowhere is it more apparent than in this sequence, where all I wanted to do was grab the item from the memory, the blue ghost thingy. To do that you have to lock onto it first, and trust me that is easier said than done. To be fair, I should have cleaned up the area a little before attempting to do this, but I already done it once and I didn't feel like doing it again. So I wanted to just grab it and move on. Even still, it shouldn't be that difficult for me to pick out a target. I mean, I ran right up to this thing, target square in my sight, and still the game gets it wrong. Okay, that's the last time I'm going to bring up the camera. It just baffles me how it somehow feels worse now compared to when the game released. And as I really, really wish, this of my past so for this next part, I'm going to pause the video for just a moment and I want you guys who have played the game to type two words that come to mind when you see this area. Got it? Well, mine are anguish and cheap. And cheap. And cheap. And cheap. Let me explain why I detest this area and wish to never return here. Starting at the bridge, I took a minute too long to cross due to a fact I'm no longer allowed to mention. I swear if that last orb killed me, I would have cried. Then you have to make your way up to the next flower bed while trying to avoid the onslaught of champion enemies waiting in ambush. But the real kicker here is this asshole and her aimbot Kamehameha. Cause as long as she's perched up here, you're not allowed to explore this area at your own leisure and if you do catch up to her, she teleports to this tight passageway where she continuously spams moves that's designed to keep you at bay. To the point where there's too much visual clutter to make heads or tails of anything or we're both standing waiting for the other person to make a move. Just to put a pin in this area, I want to say there's not been many times, if any, where I've chosen to leave an area unexplored and deemed it not worth the stress. I believe the lower part of this area is the only place that I haven't had the patience to clear. Not even a suicide run just to get the items. That to me shows just how hostile this area really is. Thankfully the sinner in this area didn't kick my ass as hard as the surrounding level. As for the fight, I really enjoyed the skillful huntress design of Loren. The only problem being that she uses this one ability to dash off screen which causes the lock on to detach. Now, I don't have a problem with the ability itself, in fact I find it fitting for this character's design. The issue is locking on again with this terrible camera, and I feel like a broken record so I'm gonna move on to this. That's it. That's all I wanted to show you, this character can get fuck right off. 
Judge Cleric was the next big bad on our list. And even though she was a fun boss to fight, in terms of spectacle she was rather unremarkable. I eventually resorted to dual wielding once more to get that slight damage advantage. I'm telling you man, dual wielding straight up melts bosses. With this strat I ended up beating her in a flash. Strangely, I would rank this boss higher up on the list than most others. Cause even though she may have been somewhat unremarkable, it was still fun to learn her moves and have that back and forth dance with her. So overall, yeah, a pretty cool boss. So after cleansing the beacon, it was time for the final stretch. Starting with General Grievous, I mean the Light Reaper. As much as I love this fight, there's two small issues that bug me just a bit. 1. Every time you start this fight, the boss has to do this Dragon Breath and Dragon Stomp attack twice before you actually get to fight him. So every time you attempt this fight, you are subjected to about a minute of theatrics before the fight even begins. Secondly, yep you guessed it, Hexwax casts Blue Eye of Protection. Except this time you can't destroy it mid-fight. Instead, before the fight, you have to enter Umbral, climb up the ladder and rip out this man in the wall. Only then does it become a fair fight. I genuinely do not understand the purpose of this other than to force you to restart the fight if you missed it the first time. I believe it to be an objectively bad decision and find it completely redundant. Getting back to the Light Reaper, when you take away his magic shield, the fight becomes trivial. Fun, but easy. It only took a few attempts to bring him down which was kind of a disappointment because they spent the whole game building up this fight. If you came expecting a tough showdown with a formidable opponent, you'll be sorely disappointed. But fear not, because just after the Light Reaper do we run into Andreas of Ebb. This dishonorable dick vowed to help us against the Light Reaper, but instead fled the fight only to stop us at the gate in hopes of claiming the lamp for himself. Honestly, when it comes down to it, this guy gave me more grief than the actual boss. His trickster build proved to be a handful for my impatient playstyle. After about 20 minutes of attempts, I managed to bring him down. And about 2 minutes after that, we were at it again, this time with the Iron Wayfarer. A rather uninteresting fight that's easily telegraphed and a bit claustrophobic. Last up was Demerose the Marked. Not really much to say here other than she was a fire mage with a fashion sense of the Sith Lord. Finally, it was time to put everything I learned so far into practice. And what did I learn so far? Not much if I'm honest. I've learned that this game employs cheap tactics and sure enough, this stretch was the going out of business sale. The castle area felt especially egregious in design, with champions shoved into every corner of it and ambushes aplenty. It's a damn shame because the layout of the castle itself is actually really good. I mean, if the area wasn't saturated with enemies, I would have loved to take my time to comb through the castle and unearth all its secrets. But alas, I ended up pulling multiple suicide runs to gain any progress and eventually, the path opened up to lead us to the throne room. The sight of the sundered monarch mourning at the foot of the queen's statue was quite a sad and sorrowful moment to behold. But I wasn't here to sympathize. I was here to kick ass and after taking it on the chin for the whole game, it is time for me to dish out some cheap justice of my own. After getting a few good ones in, a second cutscene played, leading me to believe that maybe we could have spared this wretched soul. Let me know in the comments if that's the case. But what's done is done and we were now fully engaged in a battle to the death. A battle that was relatively short lived. I think this was the only boss that I beat one shot, not counting the sinners or champions. It was an underwhelming battle but I had faith that the showdown with a deer would give me the thrilling edge of my seat action that I craved. But when I reached the arena and killed one of his zombie followers, his health dropped and so did my enthusiasm for this boss fight. I didn't know what was more disappointing. The fact that the final boss was just another gimmick fight? Or the fact that I had to do the fight twice because it bugged out the first time? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure if it was working as intended the second time around. You see, the first time I took on the fight there was a fiery dome protecting the center platform. I even rolled into it at some point, so in my mind it's clearly a barrier. So when I eventually beat his minions and they stop appearing at some point, I'm left pottering about for about 20 seconds until I spontaneously combust. There is no clear indication of what needs to be done here. I end up googling the solution only to find out you're supposed to approach the circle once you defeat his minions. So essentially I beat the fight the first time but the cutscene did not play. 
The second time I ended up dropping his health all the way down and once again, nothing happens. In fact, once I step into the circle, the inferno gauge starts balding and eventually it hurts me. At this point, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do and playing hokey pokey with this ring seems like a great way to get myself killed again. All of a sudden, a cutscene plays out of nowhere and I remember breathing a huge sigh of relief because the manner in which this game ended was just so off-putting that I was glad it's over. As the credits rolled, the thought of creating a new character had crossed my mind, but was swiftly overshadowed by the prospect of running some of these levels again. That being said, I think this game would be more enjoyable on the second run. Knowing where to go and what awaits you might alleviate some of that unrelenting stress of a blind playthrough of this game. On that note, I want to share sentiment with you guys and tell me if you agree, because once it clicked, I couldn't shake the feeling. To me, Lords of the Fallen's enemy placement feels distinctly like the testers would meticulously place enemies based on rerunning the area multiple times, and would dispatch them in a very specific order and manner, leaving little to no room for deviating from the method. Also, I may have discovered this a little too late, but it is absolutely essential that you have a ranged attack strategy. Lastly, I want to say something to the devs. If by some miracle someone from Hexworks actually sees this. It's clear that you guys had a vision for this game, and I hope you saw it through as intended. Although, I can tell you for sure that if you were to loosen the grip slightly on some of these design choices, you would appeal to a larger audience. Now I'm not saying you should abandon your core principles, but a small compromise can go a long way to keep players interested. And really that is what is most important when making a successful game. Gameplay will always be king, and sometimes a compromise on the creator's part goes a far way to ensure the player feels accommodated in the experience with the game. Just looking at something like Lies of P, a game that I considered perfect at launch, was slightly altered to accommodate players that found it a bit tough to complete. It allowed the game to go slightly further and expand their fanbase. I want to end off by saying I hope Hexworks has another go at Lords of the Fallen, they really do deserve it. And even though I may have complained all the way through the game, I feel the game has really solid bones. As always, I'm Mole Man. Thank you for watching if you made it this far, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.